turn to the preaching of the word. And our passage this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew, the very uh, closing uh, of that book and the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 28, uh, verse 16. Please stand as we, as we turn to God's word. Matthew 28, 16. Now the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is God's word. Please pray with me. Father, we thank you that in calling us to yourself, you give us clear direction and purpose for life. Pray for Pastor Trent now as he preaches your word, that he would do so with great power and boldness and, and conviction, Lord, that, that we would hear from you, that we would be a people of the word, marked by your word, living by the power of your spirit for the glory of Christ. Amen. Amen. That's very exciting to me because that's been a long time coming. I'm excited to talk to you today about the rhythm of our mission. But before I do that, I want to point out the obvious to you. And that is that we live in a world that's filled with bad news. All you have to do is turn on your TV any time of day and you are likely to find the latest breaking news about the latest mass shooting in a public place with 24-7 coverage looking into why this happened and how can we prevent such a terrible thing from happening again in the future. That story will be interrupted by the latest car bomb to go off somewhere in the Middle East, killing many innocent bystanders by the latest terrorist group trying to make a name for themselves. That story will be uh, interrupted by the, the latest investigative report that's revealing that Child sex trafficking is a reality even in beautiful places like Collier or Lee County. That news will be interrupted by the latest riots that are happening somewhere in our country on the basis of injustice that's being done or at least perceived injustice. And that demonstration is occurring by doing lots of acts of injustice. In addition to that, You'll hear in financial news about the latest big wig at the big company who put profits ahead of morals and created a culture where if you told the truth, you're going to be fired. And so now the whole company is in great danger. Most Americans today now live in broken homes. Many people are suffering the ravages of addictions of some form or another. The world's answer to the question, why are we here, leads people to looking for their significance in their sexuality, in their career, or in their stuff. Is a world full of bad news. Is there any hope for a world like this with an endless cycle of 24-7 bad news. The same things over and over and over again. Is there any hope for a world like that? Enter the church. The church has a unique and distinctive calling from God 
that only we can fulfill in this world. The risen Lord Jesus Christ has called a people out of bad news with the good news of the gospel and then commissions us to take that good news of the gospel back into the world of bad news. But if the church does not rise up and embrace the mission that Jesus has called us to do, there is no one else to bring ultimate good news to this bad news world. The future and the quality of the world that we and our children and grandchildren will live in is going to be largely dependent upon whether or not we rise up and mobilize to fulfill the mission that Jesus gave us before he ascended into heaven. And that's why we have the mission statement that we do at Covenant Church. We've been saying this statement for years. Probably many of you, if you've come with us, you can say this statement by heart. We will develop and deploy fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ to disciple our family, community, and world. But though you've been saying that for several years now, you may not have any idea how to actually do it. You may not have any idea what this looks like on a day-to-day -day basis. You may be wondering, I love our mission statement, but what actually am I supposed to do? Well, we've got today's message and the next eight weeks talking about how individually and collectively we're going to live out the mission God has given us in Matthew chapter 28 that we've summarized in our mission statement. So that's what we're going to do. Today, we're going to talk about the why of our mission, the what of our mission, and the how of our mission. But we're just going to touch on the how of our mission because the next eight weeks are all about how. Today, I really want to focus on why is this our mission and what actually is the mission, okay? First of all, the why of our mission. Why are we committed to developing and deploying fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ to disciple our family, community, and world? Well, because of what Jesus says in verse 18 of Matthew 28. He's risen from the dead. He's on the Mount of Olives. He's about to ascend into heaven to the right hand of the Father. But before he goes, he has one last word for his disciples. And this is what he says. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. That's good news. You may not know it, but you will. That's good news when Jesus says, all authority on heaven and on earth has been given to me. Why are we about our mission statement? Why do we have the mission statement we have? Because we have good news, and it's contained right there. Now, Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now, if any of you are Greek scholars out there, you will know that when you translate the original Greek, you know what it says? All authority on heaven and on earth has been given to me. All of it. It's as clear in Greek as it is in English. Jesus says, I am the ultimate authority in all the universe. There is no power on earth, princes, rulers, kings, dictators, organizations, marches. There is no power on earth that does not ultimately answer to me. And there's no power in the spiritual realm from Satan to the rulers, the principalities, all of these spiritual forces, there's not a single one that doesn't ultimately answer to Jesus as the authority overall. He has all authority. That means that he not only has the power to carry out all his holy will, but he has the very right to do so. He is the properly constituted authority over all the universe. Now, where does Jesus get this authority? Well, the Bible tells us that Jesus is given this authority from his Father. He says, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. Why did the Father give Jesus all authority? The Father gave Jesus all authority, in short, because Jesus passed the test that Adam failed. If you read back in your Bible, in the early chapters of Genesis, you'll see that Adam had a test of obedience. He failed. Consequently, all of humanity after him has now been under the reign of sin and death and Satan. Jesus, on the other hand, lives a perfect life of obedience to the Father, dies on the cross for God's people, 
And then God signifies his acceptance of that sacrifice and the righteousness of Christ by raising him from the dead. And Paul tells us he's not only raised him from the dead, but in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 20, he says, God raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. Again, this means Jesus is the big boss of the whole universe. And that's good news for you and me, and here's why, because this Jesus, who has the ultimate authority over all, both the ability and the right to carry out all his holy will, he has already demonstrated that he loves you and me by going to the cross for our sakes. And he possesses all authority. When the one who possesses all authority has already demonstrated his love by laying down his life for you, that's good news. No matter what situation you're in today, that's good news. Not only that, but Jesus has demonstrated his commitment to carrying out the Father's will, to bring about the redemption and the restoration of the new heavens and a new earth. And he has all authority. That's good news. Let me give you a little more detail on this. From the time of Adam, all of humanity has been under the reign of sin, death, and hell. Here's why. Because every time you don't give God what he deserves, you incur a debt. You owe him. When you don't give God the obedience he deserves, you've created a debt we call sin. When you don't love God with all your heart, you owe him because he's deserving of all your love. When you don't give him the worship he's deserving of, you owe him. You've got a debt to him. When you go contrary to his word, you've just created a debt to him. And the bad news is that there's a devious accountant out there who's paying attention to all your debts. His name is Satan. He's the accuser, and he's paying attention to every single thing you owe to God that you haven't given. He's keeping a list of your debts so that with that list of your debts, he can point you out to God and say, this one belongs in debtor's prison forever. Then never pay this off. And he's right. You can't pay that off. You see, you know what it takes to pay off sin? Blood. You can't pay money to take care of a sin debt. You can't, you can't pay trying to do more good than you are bad. That doesn't take care of a sin debt. The only thing the Bible tells us that eliminates a sin debt is the shedding of blood. So for many years, God allowed his people to give sort of temporary good faith payments through the sacrifice of animals toward their sin debt. But ultimately, the blood of animals can't suffice for the sin of humans. And so one day in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under law. And he was the lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world. Colossians tells us that Jesus took the sin debt, your record of sins, your debts that stood against you, the basis for which the devil is right, you should go to hell and Jesus took that list of accusations, and the Bible tells us he nailed it to the cross. And with his own blood, he wrote across your debts paid in full. Your debts paid. If you've put your trust in Jesus, Satan no longer has a basis with which to accuse you. That's why Paul can say, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Your debt's paid. You're free. You're no longer under the reign of sin and death and Satan. The Bible says you've been set free. Now you're under the reign of Jesus. You've been purchased. You belong to another. You don't belong to death anymore. You belong to life. You don't belong to the devil anymore. You belong to the Lord of glory, the one who has authority over all the universe. Brothers and sisters, this is good news. Amen? That's good news. You're not condemned. You know what? 
A lot of people outside the walls of this building don't have any idea about that. They know condemnation. They know debt. They know being under the reign of sin and being a slave to sin, but they don't know that Jesus is the way to freedom. For the Bible says, if the Son has set you free, you are free indeed. Why do we have the mission statement that we have? Because we have good news and the world needs to hear it. And so what does Jesus do? He commissions us to take that good news to the world. He calls us out of the bad news to send us into the world with good news so that those living in the midst of bad news can hear the message of salvation and new life. We're commissioned to share this good news with others. Listen to what Jesus says, verse 18 and 19. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore. It's the lordship of Christ, the fact that he is seated at the right hand of God. is the basis of our going. Now listen, Jesus doesn't say, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me Therefore, send missionaries into all the world. So you've been reading this passage that way for a long time. But that's not what he says. He says, you, you personally, you individually, you collectively, you go. He says, literally, as you're going, as you're going about your way, as you're going about your daily life, as you're going home to be with your family, as you're going out into your neighborhood, the places where you live, where you work, where you play, as you're going, make disciples. Share this good news. Tell people what Jesus has done. He's got all authority. Go and tell people that there's a way to be set free, that there's a power greater than their sin that's at work in this world. Go. That doesn't preclude us sending missionaries. We still need to be a part of doing that. But you and I have a responsibility. If Jesus is our Lord, we've been personally commissioned to go and make disciples. I love how one of my favorite writers and missionaries, Jack Miller, puts it. He says, Satan still blinds and binds the nations. But now his work is an illegal guerrilla style operation. The people are no longer under the authority of the evil one, but under the authority of the Son of Man, who requires that they submit to his rule speedily, lest he burn them up like chaff at his coming. When the church goes out with the gospel, it is not man's will being carried out. The church is out there reporting a divine summons from the throne. You are God's ambassadors, him making his appeal to the world through you, and you say, be reconciled to God through Christ. I have been, and I can tell you it's changed my life, and I want you to experience the joy of knowing Christ. It's not our business. We're just following orders. Our king said, I've set these people free. Now you go out and get them. You go out and tell them what I've done. You go out, and I can assure you that those whom I have called will come, and they will come. There's no way we can fail in this mission, brothers and sisters, except that we don't participate in it. That's the only way. Now listen, when we go out with this commissioning of Jesus, we don't go out alone. Paul says something stunning in Ephesians. Right after he tells us that Jesus has been exalted to the right hand of God, listen to what he says, that he has raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So follow this. Where is Jesus seated? He's seated at the right hand of God, far above every rule and authority in this age and the age to come. He's the boss. Where are we seated? We're seated with him. Where does that mean we are? We're right there with him above every rule, every authority. That's why Paul can say, you resist the devil and he'll flee from you. You're right there with Jesus, seated today in the heavenly places with Christ. You're like, I don't know how you're saying that. I'm sitting right here in Naples, Florida. I don't know what you're talking about. There is a mystical spiritual union that has occurred when you trusted in Christ and you are positionally seated in the heavenly places far above every other rule and authority seated with Christ so that when you go out in Jesus' name, you go out in the authority of the highest power in the entire universe. That's why when God's 
people lay hands on the sick and pray for them, that oftentimes they're healed. That's why when God's people cast out demons from those who are possessed, they're delivered and set free because there's no power that can resist the name of Jesus. You carry that authority. Now, you may not believe it, but it's true. And the more that you believe it and the more that you live into it, the more bold and confident you will be as you go out to carry out the very mission he's given us to do. So that's the why. Because we have good news and because Jesus has sent us out in his name. What's the what? What are we actually going out to do? Well, if we take it from our mission statement, we can break it down to three key verbs in our mission statement. In the first verb, contrary to your bulletin, is develop. The first verb is develop. Why do we say that we need to develop fully devoted followers of Christ? Because Jesus says that this is part of discipleship. Look at verse 19. He says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. In this passage, we can break developing down into two parts, baptizing them and teaching them. Under the category of baptizing, we have that initial gospel call when we, when we have the opportunity to invite somebody out of darkness and into light through Christ. When we can invite them to turn away from sin and rebellion and, and turn, give your life to Christ and experience the joy of serving him. And then we give them that covenant sign where we put water on them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit that, that signifies that this is a person who's been washed. They've been made new. They have a new name and a new identity. The very name of the triune God is now upon them and marks them. They've got a new trajectory for life and eternity. This is baptizing. Teaching them. Why are we teaching them? We're teaching them because following Jesus is a way of life. Being a Christian isn't just something you are. It's, it's the way you live your life every day. It affects everything that you do. It touches everything. There's no part of your life that isn't part of your Christian life. And so that's why we spend so much time on Sunday mornings reading out of this book. And why we encourage you after services or before services, depending on which one you come to, to go be a part of an adult fellowship community where you're going to hear none other than this book. And why we invite you to come through the week to various Bible studies that are hosted here and in people's homes and on Wednesday nights and almost every night of the week to come and hear this book. Because in it, God speaks to us and he teaches us his way. What are we trying to teach you? Facts and knowledge and information so you can be smarter than the person next to you? No. We're trying to teach you to observe what Jesus has commanded to teach you to obey, to live your life according to the pattern he set for us in his word. But don't get things out of order. There are some people who believe that if I live as a Christian, then God will make me a Christian and accept me. That's not how it works. Jesus says, baptizing them and teaching them. The baptizing part's important because you know what baptism shows us? Baptism is not about something you've done for God. Baptism isn't a demonstration of what you're doing for God. Baptism is a demonstration of what God has done for you. He's washed you. He's put his spirit on you. He's caused you to be born again. Baptism isn't something you do. It's something that happens to you. That's why we don't have anybody stand up here and baptize themselves. This is not how it works. It's God who is doing this work in you. You're living your life according to his commands as a result of his prior work of grace in your life. You don't become a Christian because you live like one. You become a Christian because God saves you and then he begins to change your life from the inside out and you start to live in obedience to him because of what he's already done. It's been said, and you should remember this, is it's really good. The gospel is not good advice. The gospel is good news. The gospel is not advice on if you live this way, God will love you and accept you. If you don't, you're on your own. The gospel is good news. This is what Jesus has done and accomplished for you. If you trust in him and believe in him, all of these things that are included in salvation are yours. Now live this way. That's the good news. Develop. The second piece is deploy. 
deploy. Why? Jesus says, as you're going, therefore, make disciples. Now, when we talk about deploying here in our context, you might be thinking, oh, that's the people we send down to Haiti or to India or to Nicaragua. That's not who we're talking about primarily. They're included. But when we talk about deploying fully devoted followers of Christ, you know who we're talking about? You know. We're talking about you. Each and every one of you. We want to deploy you from this place every Sunday out into the world to take good news to people who need to hear it through good works and good words. We want to deploy you. If Jesus is your Lord, then you've been commissioned to be deployed to go out and to take the good news to people in our community. Do you know how I see this gathering every Sunday when we all get together here? I see this as one big missions conference. Every week we gather all our missionaries together and we come and we worship and we celebrate what God has done. And you know what we do then? We go back out onto the mission field to do the work God's called us to do. That's who we are. That's who you are. What are you deployed then to do? You're deployed, third verb, disciple. To disciple. We will develop and deploy fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ to disciple our family, community, and world. Here's the deal. If you are a disciple of Jesus, you have been commissioned by Jesus to deploy into the world to make disciples. It starts in your family, husbands and wives, encouraging one another in the word, discipling one another, parents together or single moms and dads discipling their children. It's children discipling their siblings. It's extending beyond that to your neighbors and your tennis buddies and your golf friends and your mom's group and your bridge club. You're extending and you're making disciples. You're beginning to share good news and, and good works to the people around you. And even then, it extends beyond that to our world. Some of you will engage in cross-cultural missions. Some of you will go across the sea to bring the good news of Jesus to people. But as you're going, wherever you're going, this is your commission to make disciples. Now, some of you are you're saying, wait a second, I hear your objection. I'm not developed enough to make another disciple. I'm not. I don't know enough. I'm not far enough along. I'm not developed enough to make disciples. Well, listen, our mission statement's clear. It's not fully developed disciples that we're deploying is fully devoted ones. God doesn't use fully developed disciples to make disciples because there are none. He uses fully devoted ones. So if we're not engaging or if we're hesitant to engage in the work, we've got to do a heart check because we maybe have been saying, you know, once I'm a little farther along, then I'll engage in the mission. We've got to do a heart check and say, is it because I'm not developed or is it really because my heart's torn? between my devotion to him and my devotion to something else. And I just want to encourage you that you will be happiest when you've cast everything upon Jesus. When you've said, you're my one reason for being on this earth. If you continue to remain divided between Jesus and something else, whatever it is, you will be constantly torn and miserable. The unhappiest people are people who are double-minded and don't know what they're about. Jesus invites you to be fully in, fully sold out, fully devoted to him, and that's when you're going to begin to experience great joy and passion and power in carrying out the mission he's given us when you're all in, all in. The how of our mission, just briefly, we're just gonna touch on it today. How are we going to do this? Well. Four words sum it up. The four pieces of our mission are a rhythm. That means that they're not things we do one time, but they're things that we want to do repeatedly over time, time and time again. They're, they're like seasons. They're things that mark our lives, and we want to cycle through them over and over and over again. And as we do, we will find ourselves actually living out the mission God has given us. So what are the four words? Well, here they are. The first word is worship. Worship is that this is what you've been created for. 
our, 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 the shorter catechism says we are, we, our chief reason for existing is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. This is what worship is about. Not just on Sundays, but throughout your whole life. A life of worship. A life of being fully given over to God. That's what we're for. But we want part of your rhythm to be that you're here worshiping with us every Sunday like you are today. Because here's where you get fueled up, challenged, encouraged, where you meet with others and where you can be strengthened by others. But we don't want you just to worship on Sunday. We want you to begin to cultivate a life of worship in your family at home. And even beyond that, we want you to begin, if you don't have one already, to cultivate a personal worship life in your closet, in the privacy of solitude, just you and the Lord, and begin to discover the joy of worshiping him alone. Disciples worship. Secondly, disciples grow. The second word is grow. How does growth happen? Well, the Bible gives us a whole lot of instruction on this, and there are innumerable books on how growth happens, but we're going to make it very simple and boil it down to its most basic parts. Here's how growth happens in Christian life. Growth happens by the power of God's Spirit working through the Word in community with other believers. That, when you boil it all down, is how we grow in the Christian life. So we want part of your weekly rhythm of life to be engaging with at least one other believer over the word in prayer. Because it's as we sit with others and as they can speak truth to us and as we can speak truth to them and as we can go to this text and look through and see what are you saying to, to us, Lord, that's when we begin to make growth and progress in our Christian life. This is part of our development. So we want you to worship. We want you to grow because disciples grow. There's a third piece, and that is serve. Every one of you who have trusted in Christ have been given gifts and talents that are to be used not primarily for your own sake, but for the sake of building up the body of Christ. Paul says we're a body. We've got hands, heads, eyes, fingers. All of us have a part to play, but if we're not using our gifts to serve the body, then we are suffering as a body. So we want part of your weekly rhythm to be to commit to some area of service where you're using your gifts and talents that God's given you to help build up your brothers and sisters here in this loving family. That's the third piece, serve. The fourth piece is go. We want each and every one of you to see your personal commissioning from Jesus to go into the world, starting with your family, and bring the good news of Jesus there. Going beyond that to your community, neighbors, friends, coworkers, and so on, and then to the world. That every week when you leave these doors, you're going out with eyes saying, where Jesus would you have me to go? Who Jesus would you have me to, to serve? What would you have me to do in your name to bless those around me? It may mean you link up with one of our ministries like Pregnancy Resource Center or, or being a foster parent or I don't know what it means for you, but we're gonna talk about and explore some of those things as we go down the road. But this is the rhythm that we want disciples at Covenant Church, fully devoted followers of Christ to begin to live out, worship, grow, serve, and go. Now, there's a, phrase in the title of this sermon that I haven't talked about yet, our gospel-centered rhythm of discipleship. What do we mean when we say gospel-centered? This is really important, so don't lose me now. Gospel-centered means that at the heart of everything we do is the good news about what Jesus has already done for us. And we understand that the reason we worship and the reason we're growing, the reason we're serving and the reason we're going is because of what he's already done for us. In other words, if you're an absolute failure at worship, growing, serving, and going, God doesn't love you any less, and neither do we. It's important that we keep the gospel, that we're doing these things, we're living this rhythm because of what God has done for us, not so that he will do something for us as we go down the road. You've got to remember that, and we've got to remind each other of that as we go down the road. Secondly, being gospel-centered means that we're thinking about everything through the lens of what Jesus has done and what he's doing. It affects all of our life. Let me give it to you in the words of, of, of a blogger who's written on this. He says, think about what we mean when we call people self-centered. 
We don't mean that all they think about directly is themselves. They also think about what to eat, what to wear, how to conclude an email, and a thousand other things each day. But self informs all these other decisions. A self-centered person passes all he does and thinks through the filter of self. Self trumps everything else, and it orders all other loves accordingly. That's self-centered. So it's gospel-centered. In a similar way, to be gospel-centered does not mean that social action, marital and sexual matters, ethical issues, political agendas, our jobs, our diet, and all the rest of daily life are irrelevant. It's not like we just talk about the gospel all the time, but here's what it means. It means that all of life is viewed through the light of the gospel, that everything passes through the filter of the gospel, that what Jesus has done and is doing to restore the universe trumps everything else and orders all other loves accordingly. It means that when we're making decisions in life, we're making them all through the filter of what Jesus has done for us and what he's doing in this world. When I'm deciding what to do with my free time, I'm not thinking of it primarily from a perspective of self, but primarily through a perspective of the gospel. So we're going to be working out what that means as we go forward in this study. Let me close with this and say, as we go out into the world to bring good news, some of you might be tempted to say, it's such a bad world out there. It's so messy. It's so dark. It's so ugly. I think I'd rather just stay in our holy huddle. It's warm in here. I've got friends here. There are nice people here. Nobody gives me the middle finger in here when I take a stand for what I think is right. You know, it's safe in here. That's true. But Jesus hasn't brought us in here to keep us in here. He's brought us in here so that we could go back out and bring that message to the people on the outside. And he said, he's got all authority. When we go out in his name, we go out with that confidence that he's in charge but he closes with the words, behold, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. That doesn't just mean he sends us out there, gives us a pat on the back and says, hope it goes well, I'll be cheering from you from back here. No, when he says he's with us, it means he's working in us. His spirit is changing us from the inside out. He's working a boldness in us. He's giving us a love for our enemies and a love for the lost and a willingness to forgive people who hurt us and a willingness to cross over cultural lines that we're otherwise uncomfortable with in an unconquerable confidence in the power of the gospel to still save people today. That's what he means when he says he's going to be with us even to the end of the age. By the power of his spirit, we will develop and deploy fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ to disciple our family, community, and world as we worship, grow, serve, and go. Are you with me? We're with him. We're with him. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you've saved us and you've called us to a holy calling to worship, to grow, to serve, and to go with the gospel into the world. Help us as a body. Help us as individuals to live this out effectively. Lord, for any here who don't know Jesus and they don't know the forgiveness and the freedom we've been talking about today, I pray that even today they might say, Jesus, show me the way. Help me believe. Help me understand. I'm ready to listen. I'm ready to hear. Lord, we pray along the lines of our 106 days of prayer that you would equip and use this congregation to carry out the great commission in our world, in our time, for the glory of your name. It's in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen.